From ABC News in New York, Charles Gibson and Connie Chung. Good evening and welcome to 2020 Monday. Charlie and I are so happy you could join us. Tonight, we have an exclusive medical story that seemed like science fiction until it burst into the headlines just days ago. It's a story of doctors cheating death and bringing a new life from beyond the grave. It's also a story of emotion, heartbreak, and ultimately, great joy. The story involves a loving couple who dreamed of having a child until the husband died. Undeterred, doctors took the dead man's sperm and were able to impregnate his wife. As Lynn Sure reports, it allowed her to realize the dream of having a baby, but has some people wondering about the ethics of the case. Every baby is a miracle. But at 8 pounds 5 ounces, Brandilyn Vernoff redefined the term when she was born almost three weeks ago. Her mom, Gabby, in her first interview since the birth, proudly pointed out that the baby takes after both herself and her husband, Bruce. She has a combination of the two, probably. What do you see in her of her father? Uh, probably her nose <laughs> and her toes. These two. These two? These are Bruce's toes. That Brandilyn bears a resemblance to her father, that she exists at all, is what makes this such a remarkable story. Because Bruce Vernoff has been dead for nearly four years. That's three years before his baby was even conceived. She was born out of her family's passion and previously unthinkable medical technology. When you look at a picture like this, what goes through your mind? Happy memories. His parents, Vidalia and Wallace Vernoff, still light up when they speak of his good looks and charm. He was such a lover of nature from the time he was so small sort of nature boy. Uh, it, it really depicts him. Bruce was a physical fitness buff, practiced martial arts. He even starred in a low-budget kung fu movie. This is an amusing one. He told us one day very excitedly that when he stopped for gas at a gas station, some young man came up to him and said, <laughs> may, I, may I have your autograph? <laughs> Bruce met Gabby in 1987 when she came to Los Angeles from Mexico and started to work for his family. The first time I saw him, I, I like him very much, and I, I just fell in love with him. When you saw him for the first time, was there anything in you that said, I'm going to marry him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how, but I knew I was going to marry him. It took three years, but they tied the knot in 1990. Just a few weeks later, in a terrible car crash, Bruce shattered his leg. I'm in a lot of pain. That really changed a lot of his life, but it also made us understand what a beautiful girl Gabby was because she was with him every day. The pain persisted every day of Bruce's life as he worked at rehabilitating his leg. He and Gabby lived in his parents' house, and everyone in his close-knit family was already looking ahead. I could project into the future and see little grandchildren coming along and getting to enjoy them. But the door to that future slammed shut on July 3rd, 1995. Gabby says she and Bruce had slept in separate rooms the night before, so he could watch TV. That afternoon, she returned home from school and found Bruce lying lifeless against the bed. What did you do? Scream and cry. Did you have any idea what might have happened? Then no. No, I didn't know what happened then. I just knew that my husband was there and he was called, he was, he was dead. Gabby called Bruce's parents and sister who were on vacation in Las Vegas. It was a frantic phone call. We couldn't believe it. It was incredible. Uh, we were totally in a state of shock. The Vernoffs got home within hours, mourning their son, dead at 35 of multiple drug intoxication, including, according to the coroner, morphine and oral prescription sedatives. The family was aware that Bruce had become addicted to painkillers since the car crash, but they believe this was accidental. We realized this was just one horrible event, uh, not of his doing. As the horror sank in, the family huddled together for strength. But that night, before they even planned his funeral, their anguish took an extraordinary turn. Bruce's sister, Suzanne. 
One of the things Gabby said was, I wish we had had the children, the family that we were planning. We had plans for that the next year, my husband and I. I remembered reading that sperm could stay viable in a human being, even after death, for a length of time. I wasn't sure of the period, but I did know that. And I said, we can maybe have Bruce's sperm removed and have it as an option for later. Did you have an immediate reaction that you wanted to do this? Oh, yeah. Right away. No question whatsoever? No question, no doubt. <laughs> Did you think there was anything strange about doing it that way? Uh, no. I still don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> was this really possible? Could Bruce's sperm be collected and then used to conceive a baby? With no real information, the family was sure of one thing. They had to act quickly. Bruce had been dead for more than 12 hours, and they needed help. We didn't locate one doctor for hours, and we had just about totally given up. Finally, they got a call back from their family physician, Dr. William Skinner. We explained it to him briefly, and then uh, we said to him, Bill, do you know anybody who ever gets involved with retrieving sperm? That's an unusual request at any time, but at 11 o'clock at night on the 4th of July weekend, it's, it's pretty tough. But I had known of Dr. Rothman's interest in this area and research in this area, and so I called him. This is the man Dr. Skinner contacted. Dr. Cappy Rothman, a prominent urologist who pioneered the procedure in 1978. It was after midnight when he spoke with Suzanne. I said, I'm the sister of, of, in a family, we've just lost my brother. A family has just lost a precious human being. And we are, we understand you have been in the business of sperm retrieval. He was dead for a period of time. I didn't know if it was going to be viable. I didn't want to give him hope. But there was enough pain on the other end of the phone that I would get up at 12 o'clock at night. Suzanne remembers that Dr. Rothman asked about the widow and whether the family was in agreement. And then he said to you, what, at the end of the conversation? That he would meet us at the coroner's office in the morning. And that you should bring a cooler. <laughs> a cooler. Mm -hmm. They got to the coroner's office at 6 a.m. on July 4th, 1995. While the family waited, Dr. Rothman went down to the morgue to work on Bruce's body. Was there anything unusual about the procedure? Was there anything difficult about it? No, it was technically incredibly easy. How long did it take? Fifteen minutes. Dr. Rothman explained that it was a simple surgical procedure, removing an organ called the epididymis. Adjacent to the testicle is a little tubular structure that has tiny tubes within it that are 20 feet long, compressed into less than two inches. And it has hundreds of millions of sperm. It's where sperm are stored prior to an ejaculation. Once you have removed the epididymis, then what do you do? I place the epididymis in a sterile container with a fluid medium, and then with a scissors, I open up the epididymis in many, many spots, and then squeeze the epididymis to squeeze the fluid and sperm out into the media. So essentially what you're doing is taking this long, intertwined tube and squeezing on it to squeeze the sperm out of it? Correct, yes. He had put the sperm into some uh, vials or whatever, and he said, here, where's your, where's your ice cooler? <laughs> he put them in the ice cooler and said that he would now take them to something called the cryobank for deep freeze. What was going through your head? This must have been the most bizarre experience. You're grieving, you're a little bit hopeful, You've got this almost sci-fi thing happening in front of you. Truthfully, I didn't really believe that something would come of this because it did sound like science fiction to me. But what it did do was, it's a silly expression, but it was the only game in town. Were you consciously thinking, this could be my grandchild, this could be Bruce's child? Oh, yes, how could I not? <laughs> Certainly. Keep in mind, doctors believed it was possible, but could offer the Vernoffs no assurances. In fact, Dr. Rothman told us that in his experience, most of the families he'd worked with were comforted simply by knowing part of the man they loved lived on, frozen in a sperm bank. 
But that wasn't enough for Gabby, now a 28-year-old widow. I wanted to start right away, yeah. She was ready to do something rather quickly, and we felt this is way, way, way too soon. Why did you think that? Because we felt that you have to undergo a grief period, and you're not really thinking straight during a grief period, and you might do something that you would regret later. And so Gabby waited, got some counseling, and a year and a half later got the go-ahead. She was about to try to have the baby of her dead husband. The procedure is the one now routinely used for infertile couples. First, the woman's eggs are removed and taken to a lab. There, each egg is injected with a single living sperm. If fertilization takes place, the embryos are implanted in the woman's uterus. A woman Gabby's age usually has about a 40% chance of getting pregnant. But there were no odds in this case because no one had ever succeeded using sperm taken posthumously. It's not even known if anyone had tried. That didn't discourage Gabby or her in-laws. How many vials of sperm were available? Five vials of sperm were available, and Gabby had authorized two of them. Doctors would thaw those two vials and look for living sperm. The family was full of optimism, but the news from the embryologist was bleak. He dethawed these two vials and discovered that nothing was moving. So he took two more, looked at them, and saw the same thing. Doctors identified the sperm they thought had the best chance and did get three embryos, which were implanted in Gabby's womb. But none of them took. She wasn't pregnant, and there was only one vial of sperm left. What did that mean to you? It means that probably uh, it wasn't going to work after all this time. It was the worst news since Bruce's death. The hope they'd all been clinging to, the possibility of a child from his sperm, was remote at best. Now, it seemed almost impossible. Just when things seemed most bleak, a sleepless night and a chance encounter would change Gabby's entire world. And how it happened will surprise you. The baby who was the first of her kind, an impossible dream, but some say she should never have been conceived. The miracle and the controversy when 2020 continues. As you've seen, Gabby Vernoff's struggle to have a baby using sperm taken from her dead husband now has only a slender chance of success. Could a man father a child after he had already been dead for 30 hours? And should medical science help his widow do it? Those questions hang in the air as Lynn Scher continues the story of a woman whose dream is nothing more than a faint hope. Gabby Vernoff was understandably anxious. Having failed to become pregnant the first time, she knew only one vial of sperm remained from her late husband Bruce's body, her last chance to have his baby. I can't explain the disappointment. It was really upsetting. Very upsetting. The doctor suggested she wait before trying again, telling Bruce's father... Science is not complete at this time. You never know what can happen if you wait a while longer. Maybe something will develop. Uh, even wait a year. But the prospect of ever finding any healthy sperm seemed dim to his wife, Adelia. I thought it wasn't meant to be at that point with that, but I knew there was one vial left. Then one night, unable to sleep, she saw a TV program with a doctor who had a technique for identifying living sperm that were no longer moving. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I wrote down the name, Dr. Paul Turek, and that he was somewhere in San Francisco. The test that I work on is, is called the hyposmotic swelling test. It's, called, it's basically a sugar weak sugar, sugar solution that you throw sperm into and they don't like it that much and they swell up and their tails curl and this and a dead sperm doesn't do that so every time that happens in front of you then you can be assured that that sperm is alive. Dr. Paul Tura came to Los Angeles to assist Gabby's doctors. Fifteen months after her first attempt she would have one final chance. Did you ever think about stopping? About not doing it? Oh no, no. <laughs> No, because behind all that pain, it was going to be a big reward. But the initial signs were not encouraging, as illustrated in this video from another case. We encountered the same situation 
the second time when the last file of sperm, their last opportunity essentially, um, was opened. We counted largely a pool of dead looking sperm. And we went through that last vial of sperm for several hours and we found some moving sperm. And then we used the swelling test to find living sperm that weren't moving. And then those sperm were injected into the eggs. Two embryos were formed and implanted in Gabby's womb. Would they take? Constant hope and constant wishing and constant uh, uh, tension for that period of time. How did you get the news finally? Gabby heard it because they called her. She told me that the results from the test were positive. And I was really chill. What did you do? Uh, no, thank you very much. Oh, I love you and all those. And I called my in-laws and I told them the news. And they were really happy for me too. And she said uh, very simply, <laughs> I'm pregnant. <laughs> and that was, wow, that's all she had to say. Uh, we all erupted. Uh, we heard it almost at the same time, and it was, it was glorious. It was also expensive, some $35,000 before Gabby even got pregnant. But with one of the embryos now growing into a baby, Whoa. she was ecstatic. Oh. For the first time in, since Bruce had left us, Gabby was elated. You could see a smile on her face. You could see genuine happiness. And when she felt the baby stirring within, oh, they, there was nothing as beautiful as seeing her face. Oh, sometimes she's kicking. Sometimes she's, she has hiccups. On March 17th, exactly nine months and one week from conception, Gabby Vernoff went to the hospital. That night, after a painful and lengthy labor, Brandilyn Danielle was born. I don't think I've seen anyone happier. The first baby ever known to be conceived and delivered with sperm taken posthumously from the father. What was the first thing you thought of when you saw her? Oh, uh, just what a beautiful baby. <laughs> oh, it was quite emotional. And you ran down the hall and what did you say to Wally? I said, Wally, she's here. <laughs> and I said, wow. How do you think Bruce would react if he knew what you had done? I think that he would be really happy. What makes you say that? Because I know my husband, and I know that he would do anything to make me happy. But the Vernoff's delight was not shared by everyone as news of the birth became public. Critics questioned the ethics of the procedure that had led to her existence. Professor Glenn McGee is at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Bioethics. We shouldn't make children from the dead, uh, whether it's sperm banks or donor eggs or uh, in the families where we're talking about harvesting from dead husbands or even through cloning or other new reproductive technologies. And the reason for that is simple. Unless there's clear consent to make a child in this way, it violates the rights of the person involved. But Dr. William Skinner, the Vernoff's family physician, says while Bruce didn't put it in writing before he died, he and Gabby were planning a family. Yes, they had wanted to have children and had planned to have children, and this his uh, un untimely death was uh, had, had really sort of put an end to those hopes. The Vernoff showed us this shaky home video to document the fact that Bruce often said he wanted children. Okay, so that's Bruce? That's Bruce, and, Gabby. and there's Gabby. I might have a boy and a girl, that's it. Well, what if I had a daughter the first time around, and then like, what if seven more, the next seven times? Like We're not going to have written consent under circumstances such as this. When I feel as a physician, as a healer, as a compassionate person, that I'm doing the right thing, I do it. Dr. Cappy Rothman, the urologist who retrieved Bruce's sperm, runs the largest sperm bank in the country. He says the procedure is rare. He knows of only about 50 cases, but that it gives the mourning family hope. It lessens the grief. I see that when they ask me. Just because they see a sperm swimming around? Well, it's more than just a sperm. It's a future to them. I see a sperm. You might see a sperm. They see hope. I think Dr. Rothman is compassionate. I just think he's wrong. I think we've got to stop this, nip it in the bud, before it becomes a phenomenon of people having babies, either through cloning or postmortem sperm, uh, without permission. Professor McGee and others say we need laws to regulate this new technology, that the decision should not be made by doctors. 
But Dr. Rothman, while agreeing women should go through a waiting period before using the sperm, says it's a judgment call. Do you think this is the way a baby ought to be made? With Gabby, yes. With Gabby, it's beautiful. Because that baby is coming into a very loving family. Is there any part of it that's bittersweet for you? I can tell you this much, uh, that when Brandilyn came, it brought back the loss of Bruce tremendously. It does make you stop and think, gee whiz, shouldn't he be here uh, with uh, holding his own child to see the product that, th that he really had wanted. What a shame. <coughs> Gabby says she still misses her husband and realizes one life doesn't replace another. But Brandilyn has helped her to accept the past and turn instead to the future. What will you tell your daughter when she's old enough to understand? I would tell her how much she was wanted by me and my husband and my whole family. The requests for post-mortem sperm retrieval are still relatively few. They're growing fast. According to one study, more than 40 over a one-year period. But this is the first one that's worked. And now that one has worked, you would suspect that the number of requests would go up even faster as people learn that this one was a success. Now, I'm sure, Charlie. You know, she was born just this past March 17th, St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Day. Uh -huh. And they call her, the family calls her Little Leprechaun. We'll be right back.